Hello everyone. Um, in this chapter three, we are going to take a look at first the uh, financial statements of a government as well as uh, introduce the concept of budgetary accounting. So before I get into the PowerPoint, what I wanted to show you was an example CAFR. Once again, a CAFR is an acronym, C-A-F-R. It stands for a Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to quickly show you the City of Boca Raton's financial section of the CAFR, specifically looking at both the government-wide financial statements as well as the fund financial statements. So the first thing that we actually see here are the government-wide financial statements. And uh, there are two government-wide financial statements, as we were taught in the prior lecture. The first one is called a balance sheet. Uh, the for formal name is statement of net position. Remember, at the government-wide level, equity is called net position. And as you can see, on one side of the balance sheet, we have our assets and our deferred outflows. And as you can see, what you see on the screen here is we've got two columns. We've got our governmental activities, and we also have our business type activities. And once again, the governmental activities are basically the governmental funds and most likely also the uh, internal service funds. The business type activities are the enterprise funds and possibly the internal service funds. These are all reported at a cruel basis. On the other side of the balance sheet, we have our liabilities and our deferred inflows. And of course, our equity section is called net position. There's a few things I want to point out here. First of all, the total uh, net position for the governmental activities. You can see here I'm circling governmental activities and total net position is $485 million. And I'm going to I'm going to ask you to remember that because in a few moments I want to show you where that $485 million how it gets reconciled to the fund financial statements. All right, so that is the first uh, government-wide statement. The second government-wide statement is a um, it's an operating statement. We can't really call it an income statement because we don't do that with governmental accounting, but we're going to call it a statement of activities. There's a few things I want to point out with the statement of activities. It is a very odd looking statement. First of all, you can see on the left hand side, we have our various governmental activities and we're going to list all of the, the, the different types of functions that this particular city is involved with. As you can see, the, the governmental activities, which once again are the general, uh, general government activities, um, what your taxes would cover, if you will. You've got your general government, law enforcement, fire rescue, physical environment, transportation, community development, parks and recreation. And then we have something called interest and fiscal charges. More on that in a minute. And then lastly, we have our business type activities. And you can see our business type activities. These are more of the, the enterprise funds or when a government provides a service to the residents of the community uh, for an additional user fee. Typically, the business type activities are not covered by taxes and it's covered the majority of it, if not all of it, um, is covered by user fees. Water and sewer, cemetery, golf course, stormwater utility, and sanitation are the business type activities for the city of Boca Raton. Okay, so what we have here is we list it out by function, and you can see the first column is called expenses. So m most financial statements that you've seen in the past um, the operating statement starts with revenues, but this statement actually starts with expenses. All right, and then um, so all of these expense numbers, as an example, general government 28 million, law enforcement 72 million, fire rescue 35 million, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, 
These are all called direct expenses because they can be directly related to a program or a function. Now this last item here, interest and fiscal charges, this is an expense, this is interest expense that uh, the city of Boca incurred in the prior year, $1.9 million. But because the interest is for various different functions, um, what the way we actually present it in the financial statements is not to allocate it, not to come up with an allocation method and allocate it among all the different functions or programs. We just want it stated separately. So when we do that, this is called an indirect expense. So the expenses up here are direct expenses. This last one that is highlighted is called an indirect expense. Okay, after the expense column, then we have three columns for program revenues. And here I'm circling the three different program revenues. We have charges for services, we've got operating grants and contributions, and lastly, we have capital grants and contributions. These program revenues are basically revenues derived directly from that, the operation of that particular function or program. So charges for services, those are basically fees that uh, the government is charging the users. So for the various governmental activities, you can see it totals 67 million. For the business type activities, it's totaling 70 million. So as I said to you before, with the business type activities, the user fees are going to cover the expenses of the, the individual programs, and it certainly does in this case. All right, they're like for-profit businesses. You can think of business type activities as uh, as for-profit business, or at least break-even businesses. Operating grants; those are basically grants, and and what a grant is is really a gift from a uh, most likely a senior government. So. In this case, it's the city of Boca Raton. They may have received grant money from the state or maybe even the federal government to run day-to-day -day operations, hence the term operating grants. And then capital grants. Uh, whenever you see this word capital in this class, I need you to think fixed assets. So these are grants given to the city of Boca Raton for, for either some construction of some fixed assets or purchase of fixed assets. All right, so if we take the expenses and, uh, and then subtract out the three revenue columns, um, or I should say we take the three revenue columns and subtract out the expenses, you get either a net expense or a net revenue. So for the governmental activities, as you can see, it is a net expense of negative $131 million. For the business type activities, as you can see, it's actually a positive. It is a net revenue of $13.7 million. That is the first half of the statement of activities. The second half is down here, and the second half is called, and you can see I'm highlighting it here, it's called general revenues. And the general revenues, this is where we're going to record or report, I should say, all of the taxes generated by the organization plus any other revenue items that cannot be directly attributable to one of the functions or programs. So you can see the city of Boca has property tax, utility tax, franchise tax, sales tax, infrastructure tax, gas tax, uh, incremental property taxes, state shared revenues. This is the state of Florida sharing monies, sharing revenues with the city, investment earnings, gain on disposal of a fixed asset, miscellaneous. And then lastly, we have transfers. And we'll study transfers more as the weeks go on. Transfers are basically money that's sent from one fund to another fund, and there's no expectation of a payback. So it's not a loan. It's a one-way street. Think of a transfer as a one-way street versus a loan being a, a two-way street where the money is expected back. So a transfer, as you can see, in total, it's going to net to zero, and that's why we have a little dashed line here. But there were transfers, clearly uh, transfers coming out of enterprise funds. That's why there's a negative in the business type activities column. And probably, most likely, a transfer into probably the general fund, but that's why the governmental activities column 
is positive, but they will always net to zero. All right, so if we take our um, net revenue or expense from the top part of the statement, and then we take into account our general revenues, what we get is called the change in net position. In a for-profit company, we would call this line net income. So for the governmental activities, the change in net position is 6,338,980, and um, add that to the beginning net position, and you get the ending net position. Once again, remember, we saw that $485 million moments ago on the balance sheet. So keep, keep remembering this number. I also want you to remember this number, the change in net position for governmental activities, 6,338. Okay, so those are the government-wide statements. Now what I want to show you are the fun financial statements. Remember, there are two levels of financial statements, the government-wide, which we just saw, and now we're going to see the fund financial statements. Remember, there are three categories of funds. We've got governmental funds, we have proprietary funds, and lastly, we have fiduciary funds. So first, the governmental funds. The governmental funds are basically, once again, um, a listing of all the various governmental funds. These are the funds, basically the activities to record the, the general government activities of, uh, of the particular entity. Um, governmental funds use what's known as modified accrual accounting. That's important. I'm going to show you why in a few moments. So once again, the balance sheet, you know, one side you've got your assets and deferred outflows. On the other side, we have our liabilities, deferred inflows, and our equity. Equity at the governmental fund level is called fund balance. Once again, it's not net position, but it will be fund balance. All right, and so if we look across, we have the general fund. We have a uh, Meisner Park revenue fund. We have a five-year capital improvement fund, and we work our way over. We have an infrastructure fund, a beach and parks fund. And look at this last column here, non-major governmental funds. Remember, there is a mathematical formula to figure out which funds are major and which funds are non-major. The major funds are right here, and they get their own column. The non-major funds, we're going to combine them in one column for presentation purposes. But later on in the CAFR, we will break that out into the various columns. All right, so let me just come down here, and we can see this last row is, I'm sorry, the second to last row. This is the total equity or total fund balance of our governmental funds. I'm circling it here, and uh, remember this number, 146 million and change. All right, so that is, first of all, our um, government-wide statements and our governmental fund uh, uh, balance sheet. And before we move on to the governmental fund operating statement, I want to show you the required reconciliation of the balance sheet of the governmental funds to the statement of net position. And once again, the balance sheet of the governmental funds that is prepared using modified accrual accounting. The statement of net position, this is a government-wide statement, and that is prepared using accrual accounting. So what we're going to do is you can see the starting point of the reconciliation is the ending fund balance at the governmental fund level. You remember this number? We just took a look at it less than a minute ago, 146 million. This is the ending equity for the governmental funds. And if we look at the bottom of the, of the reconciliation, this is the equity of the governmental activities column in your government-wide statements. You remember this number, 485 million. And I'm not asking you to know it now, but everything here in the middle, these are the differences between modified accrual accounting and accrual accounting. By the time we get to chapter nine, we're going to be able to understand and we're going to be able to put a reconciliation together. So you will know the differences between modified accrual and accrual. All right. Now, here we have a, our governmental funds. This is our operating statement called Statement of Revenues, Expenditures, and Changes in Fund Balance 
Once again, all the major funds get their own column. And we're going to come over here to the non-major funds combined into one column. And there's the grand total. The, the, the last column is your grand total. And uh, we can see that uh, the third to last line, this is the net change in fund balance. In a for-profit world, we would have called this net loss. But there it is, negative 2,152,857. Remember that number because there is a second reconciliation that is required as well. And we're going to reconcile the change in fund balance. There it is, negative 2,152. We just saw that a few seconds ago. And remember, that was prepared using modified accrual accounting. And if we come all the way down to the bottom of the reconciliation, there you're going to find the change in net position at the government-wide level. Hopefully you remember this number from that weird looking statement, the statement of activities. That was the government wide operating statements and everything in the middle are the differences. It's the reconciliation between modified accrual and accrual. Okay. And then the uh, financial statements go on. I won't spend too much time on it, but so we took a look at the government wide statements. We took a look at the governmental funds and the reconciliations. And then we have our last two fund categories. Here are our proprietary funds. All right, proprietary funds, we're going to put together a balance sheet. Uh, we also have to put together an operating statement. And uh, lastly, with proprietary funds, you also have to put together a cash flow statement. And a uh, little uh, little uh, piece of advice here with cash flow statements you actually have to use the direct method you are unable to use the indirect method for a proprietary fund cash flow statements and by the way this is the only place you're going to find cash flow statements in the entire government all right and then uh, lastly we have our fiduciary funds uh, I'm sorry here's more of the cash flow statement and here we go to the right we have our, our fiduciary funds, um, and uh, so in this case, we have a trust fund. The city has a pension trust fund, and if they had agency funds, it would be listed here as well, but they do not. All right. Uh, I know I went through those last two uh, fund categories pretty quickly. Uh, we will certainly get to that in more depth as uh, the weeks go by, and we get to specific chapters dealing with proprietary funds and uh, fiduciary funds. Um, accrual accounting is used for these funds, so as you can see, there is no reconciliation from the government-wide statements, or I should say from the fund statements to the government-wide statements. Not necessary because it's all at accrual basis. All right, so I just wanted to briefly kind of show you the um, a, a sample CAFR. And for those of you that want to take a look at that a little bit closer, and I do suggest you do that. Um, you will find the City of Boca's CAFR in the Chapter 2 module on your, um, on your canvas. You will find the City of Boca's CAFR, and you can take a look at that um, as, you, uh, as you study. I truly suggest, um, highly suggest that you print out at least the financial statements that we went through and tick and tie them. Tick and tie is a little informal accounting uh, uh, word or term that simply means you take out the, uh, the the report and you you agree where all the numbers come from and you match them up. So as an example, I was taking you I was taking the equity on the government wide statements, right? The net position in the governmental activities column, and you remember I was telling you oh, we're going to see this again on the reconciliation to the fund um, fund balance and and. So do that and say, oh yeah, now I see where this number comes from and where it goes and how it's all tied in. You are going to see that all of those financial statements uh, are, are all tied in together. Okay, so um, the first slides here are, are pretty uh, simple. The fact that we just went over some of those CAFR, um, the, some of the financial statements in the CAFR. This first slide is basically saying the format for the statement of activities. Remember, that was the government-wide operating statement. We had our expense column. You remember that? Minus, and then we had our three program revenue columns equals the net revenue or expense. And uh, 
And we also said that uh, the the expenses and the program revenues are going to be broken down by functions or, or programs, and those are basically the core operations of the government. Uh, basically, that's what a function and a program means. The expenses reported in the statement of activities are either considered direct expenses or indirect expenses. If you recall from a few moments ago, all of the City of Boca Raton's expenses are direct expenses with one exception. And that one exception was the interest. You remember that? We had interest separately stated as an indirect expense. Indirect expenses get their own line items and they do not get allocated to the different functions or programs. Okay. Our program revenues are up top. There are three of them. Once again, we have charges for services, we have operating grants, and we have capital grants. And um, then below in the uh, general revenues, that's where we're going to put all of the taxes. Um, we're going to put the transfers there. We might have some special items or extraordinary items. All right, uh, an extraordinary item is basically something that's unusual and infrequent. And a special item is unusual or infrequent, so be very careful with your wording there. And special items are also within management's control. Extraordinary items are not. And transfers, as we talked about, is basically a one-way transfer of money from one fund to another fund, a, a most likely an enterprise fund to a governmental fund. The transfers on a net basis will net to zero, okay, as we saw that. So here are the various governmental funds. We talked about this in Chapter 2. If you recall, we have our general fund, which is really the default fund. This is where all of the general government activity is going to flow through unless there is a specific reason to use one of the other governmental funds. And real briefly, Special Revenue Fund is when we have a revenue source that is either restricted or committed. We can set that aside and account for it in a Special Revenue Fund. And then we have our Capital Projects Fund. This is to account for uh, long-term general construction, general government construction, like we're building a new city hall or we're building a new park or a new police station, something like that. And then we have our debt service fund. That is basically the fund where we use uh, use it to pay back the long-term general principal and interest. And last and uh, and least, I usually hear last but not least. I'm going to say last and least permanent fund. The reason I say that is because it's kind of rare for governments to have a permanent fund. A permanent fund is when there is a contribution or a donation to the government and the donor says keep that donation intact, never spend it. In other words, keep it permanent, but use the investment earnings for whatever the donor's wishes are. All right, and as you saw in the, in the, um, the governmental fund, uh, financial statements in the balance sheet on one side, we have our current assets and deferred outflows. Uh, on the other side, we have our current liabilities and our deferred inflows. Um, and then, of course, we have our equity. Equity is called fund balance at the governmental fund level. And remember, to prepare this, we use modified accrual accounting, which we're going to get into in depth in the next few chapters. Okay. On the governmental fund operating statement, we have our revenues. We have our expenditures. We don't use the word expenses. With modified accrual, we use the term expenditures. And then we have our other section. If it's other um, cash coming in, it's called other financing sources. Another example of that would be a transfer from another fund. Well, that would be another financing source. We have some other examples of other financing sources that we will introduce as the chapters go on. And then we have other financing uses. That would be where cash flow is going out, um, but it does not meet the definition of an expenditure. And an example of that is when we do transfer money to another fund. Money's going out as another financing use. Okay, budgets. Budgets, here we go. What a, uh, let me say this. The greatest internal control tool that a government has is the budget. The greatest internal control tool 
that a government has is the budget. Budget is a very big deal with governments, with state and local governments. The budget actually needs to be passed. It needs to be voted on by the elected officials and by law that budget needs to be followed. So you can see it's a very big deal. It's a much bigger deal than for-profit companies that usually pass a budget as kind of a guideline. But with the government, they have to follow it. And so the, the mayor and the elected officials, the other uh, commissioners, they vote on it. And guess what? That budget is actually recorded. We actually record the budget in the accounts. And the reason we do that is because we want to keep track of budget balances. More on that in a minute. So here we have revenues. That's the operating account. And as you know, revenues have a credit balance. And so what we're going to see is the budgetary account that's going to be connected with the revenue accounts is called estimated revenues. All right. And the estimated revenues are going to have the opposite balance of the, the operating revenues. So the estimated revenues are going to have a debit balance. Other financing sources, they work like revenues and they'll have a credit balance. So the budget is going to be called estimated other financing sources and they will have debit balances. Next, expenditures. Expenditures, like expenses, they have a debit balance. The budget account is going to be called appropriations. Uh, you would think it would be called estimated expenditures <laughs> if we were following the logic for the first two rows. Um, but nope, there's actually a fancy word for the budget for the, for the expenditures, and that is called appropriations. And once again, the opposite balance. So expenditures have a debit balance. Therefore, appropriations are going to have a credit balance. And then other financing uses, they work like expenditures. They have a debit balance. So the budget estimated other financing uses, they will have a credit balance. And then there's something called an encumbrance, and I will get to that in a few moments when we go through some journal entries. Okay, so let me, let me flip through here. I'm not going to spend much time on this, but there are a few slides here and, and you can, um, you can read more about this, but these are the, these are the more uh, common types of revenue sources for a government. We have taxes, all right, and there are various types of taxes. Here in Florida, the, the big one is property taxes, the, the upper left uh, uh, rectangle here, but sales tax in some other states, income tax, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we have, uh, so these are all the taxes. Special assessments, this is really not a tax. A tax is for the entire uh the community at large, a special assessment is not levied against all properties. It's only levied against certain properties that are going to benefit from a particular service. Let me give you an example. Let's say there's one subdivision within the, the city that's going to get new sidewalks. All right. So in st and so what the government wants to do is assess us, you know, levy a special assessment against the property owners within that community instead of, you know, creating a tax for every single one of the taxpayers uh, in, the, in the particular community. All right, licenses and permits, um, intergovernmental revenues. We can earn revenues um, by working with other governments. All right, maybe it's one government that provides a, a service to another. Let me give you an example. Um, if you look in some, some cities, uh, they don't have their own police departments, um, but they outsource it from the county. As an example, uh, the, the city that I live in, I personally live in, um, th they don't have a police department, but I see Broward Sheriff's Office patrolling the streets. So my particular city, my local municipality has outsourced that from uh, the county. So the county is going to have intergovernmental revenue. Okay. All right. Um, we have charges for services, as you see here. All different types of charges for the various governments. Fines and forfeits. Um, it could be as simple as a, libra a late library book fine or, or a speeding ticket <laughs> and everything in between. Those are fines and forfeitures and some miscellaneous revenues. Now let's get to the budget. This is the really important part that I wanted to show you. So as I said, once the budget is formally voted on and passed, 
um, the budget is going to be recorded. And I just want to concentrate on the general the general ledger here. Don't don't worry about the subsidiary ledgers. That's not my concern at this point. Uh, you're, you're, most of you know how to prepare you know an update subsidiary ledgers. Not my concern for this course. Let's concentrate on the general journal. All right. So to record the budget for the revenues, once again we're going to use this term estimated revenues, and it will be debited. The opposite side of the budget is going to be a credit to this account called budgetary fund balance. So we are expecting $1,277,500 in revenues per our budget. Now, on the other side, the appropriations. These are the expected or the, the budgeted expenditures. $1,362,000. And once again, Expenditures are debited, so the budget or appropriations is going to be credited. And then we have a little budget for other financing uses. And once again, just like the revenue budgetary journal entry we saw on the last slide, the opposite side of the journal entry goes to this account called budgetary fund balance. Now, let me explain something to you. We record the budget. It is the first journal entry of the year. The reason why we record the budget is so we can keep track of the budget balances throughout the year. What is the budget balance? It's simply the difference between the budget and the actual. So as an example, I have appropriations of 1,362,000. If in the first month of, uh, of the operations of the year and we spent $300,000, let's say, in expenditures, so the, the budget balance or the remaining, the difference is going to be 1062000 So it's important to pass the budget so we can keep track of these budget balances. And everybody is going to know what the budget balances are. All right? a lot, you're going to find that in the government, a lot of the purchasing activity is decentralized. It's not done in the general government, uh, I'm sorry, general accounting department. The police departments, they're going to be doing their own purchasing. The fire department, they're going to be doing their own purchasing. The, the parks and rec, recreation folks, they're going to be doing their own purchasing. They know. They're the experts in the area. They know what they need to purchase. So as long as we give them a budget that's approved, they can go ahead and buy whatever they want. All right. So because of the decentralization nature of, of local governments, that's why the budget is so critical. It's like our, our it's our internal control, as I said. It keeps everybody in check. All right, now we have some actual activity. So here's some revenues that we collected: debit, cash, credit, revenues. All right, and you can see that at this point we can prepare a, a budgetary a budget versus actual statement and compare the estimated revenue versus the actual revenue, and we'll have an idea of how much more that we're expecting to to generate uh, earn in the, the rest of the fiscal year. Okay, now to a concept called encumbrances. Governments actually take one extra step that we do not do in for-profit accounting, and that is this. Whenever we sign a contract or we enter into a purchase order um, that has not been fulfilled yet or a contract that has not been fulfilled yet, we actually record a journal entry. And the journal entry is to encumber the budget. Now, in plain English, what does this mean? This basically means, okay, we sign a contract. And what the encumbrance does is the encumbrance puts a placeholder on that budget money. Effectively, what an encumbrance does is exactly what an actual expenditure does. It reduces the amount of the available budget for spending. So the encumbrance is very important. Let me give you an example, and you can see this on the screen here. Let's say we're a government and we signed a contract for $45,400 for, I don't know, landscaping services. So what the government is going to do is they're going to debit this account called encumbrances and we're going to credit encumbrances outstanding. This, these are temporary accounts. The encumbrances outstanding is actually a carve out of one of the fund balance accounts, most likely a signed fund balance. So it's effectively a, a sub equity account, if you will. 
the encumbrance is a temporary account. It's just a placeholder for that money. We're basically saying, okay, we signed a contract. We haven't spent this $45,400 yet, but we expect to within the fiscal year. Okay. Okay. Now the majority of that forty-five thousand four hundred dollars is 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 um, is spent. So the the landscaping vendor did the majority of the work. So they've done out of that forty-five thousand four hundred, they've done forty-two thousand dollars of work. So if you take a look at the first journal entry on the top of the slide, what we've done is we've basically reversed what we saw in the prior slide. The prior slide, we debited encumbrances and credited encumbrances outstanding. And what happens is once the service has been provided to the government, that journal entry gets reversed. You flip it and you can see it here. We're going to debit the encumbrance outstanding and we're going to credit the encumbrance. And what we do is immediately at the same time that we reverse the encumbrance, we replace it with the actual expenditure. And that's what this journal entry is down on the second half of this slide. We're going to debit the encumbrance and we're going to credit the, I'm sorry, did I say encumbrance? Expenditure. And we're going to credit the payable. This is accounts payable. You can see governments tend to like this, use this term vouchers payable, but that simply means accounts payable. Okay. You could see this is not a typo. Some of you might be thinking, hey, wait a minute, it's off by $400. Yeah, it is. Because the original contract was for, for this particular service, $42,000. But maybe something happened where uh, there was additional shipping charges or there was some sort of uh, price adjustment. So sometimes the expenditure may not be exactly the same as the encumbrance. And that's OK, as long as it's relatively close. If it's way off, then obviously something broke down. I don't know what happened, and that would need to be investigated. All right, so you're going to see the encumbrance is a temporary placeholder, and once the actual expenditure happens, the encumbrance gets reversed. Okay, and so uh, if you just kind of flow through, flow this through, first the budget, and that would be an appropriation. Then if we order something or sign contracts, then we're going to encumber those funds. And then once the funds are actually uh, spent, we reverse the encumbrance and we record the expenditure. And ultimately, we pay out the payable. That would be the disbursement. Okay. So in summary here, in summary, we're going to see that um, we record the budget, the first journal entry of the year. And the, the last journal entry of the year is to reverse the budget. You are not going to prepare financial statements and have an account balance and estimated revenues and appropriations. No, they, were, they will all be reversed at the end of the year. Once again, I go back to my original statement. The main reason the budget is passed and recorded as a journal entry is so we can keep track of the budget balances. Once that, once that purpose has been served, the last journal entry of the years, we can reverse the budgetary journal entries. Okay, And a couple more things here before we wrap this up. The budget is put together, as you can see, a year before the, the year starts, the fiscal year starts. So we don't have crystal balls and we could be way off. And there might be from time to time a reason why we have to revise the budget. And so revising the budget during the fiscal year is possible as well, as long as the mayor and the other elected officials vote for the budget revision. OK, so if the budget is legally amended, we will record another journal entry to adjust the budget, either upward or downward, whatever was voted on. OK, and then, of course, at the end of the year, we close out all of the budgetary journal entries, as I said. Okay, and here is a perfect example of the closing entry for the budget. You can see in the beginning of the year, we credited appropriations. And so at the end of the year, we're going to debit it. Same thing with estimated other financing uses. At the beginning of the year, we debited estimated revenue. So at the end of the year, we're going to credit it. And then, of course, the, the, the plug all right, to balance the journal entry goes to this budgetary fund balance. So this journal entry you see here is actually the closing of the original 
budget entries that we saw quite a few slides ago.